You're welcome, and my welcome as well. Katrina already um, said most of the welcomes. Um, my job today is obviously to moderate this panel. Uh, the panel is about art in the digital world. And basically that's been a bit of a hot topic in the last 20 odd years, uh, since the explosion of digital media and the explosion really of um, access to professional tools at an amateur level. We're suffering, I think, and I use that term advisedly, from a deluge of visual information, which is driven by visual, uh, digital technology. Um, the opportunity we have today is to talk to uh, three people who are engaged in thinking about um, this area from different perspectives. On my far left, your right, is Isabella Pruta. She's a practicing artist, a colleague of mine at the University of New South Wales, Art and Design. Um, and you can read about her CV online, I don't need to tell you all about her, but she is a, a practitioner. So she's grappling with those issues of digital technology on a day-to-day -day basis as a professional artist. Um, in the centre here is Michael Fitzgerald, uh, who's a writer, an editor, a distinguished editor, um, and very engaged in the Sydney art scene. Uh, I've known Michael for a few years since I got back to Australia, and it's a pleasure to be on a panel with him. And the person I just met today, Chris Winter, who, um, it says in his bio he's a veteran, a TV industry <laughs> veteran. I'm not quite sure what that means, whether he Makes was look uh, gray here. doing TV work <laughs> under fire or um, was just always involved uh, for a long time. He's also a Metro Screen Board member. The process today is very straightforward. Uh, each of the speakers are going to make a five minute presentation. We may engage in uh, something of a dialogue uh, at the front for a few minutes and then we'll open it up to questions. If you can save your questions till after that first 15 minutes is completed, I'd be extremely grateful. So our first speaker today is Isabella Puta. Thanks Isabella. Thank you Gary. So can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to speak a little bit about my, um, I mean coming from a position as an, as an artist I guess. I, I trained um, in, in photography uh, in the late 90s, so I was probably, as I kind of think, probably one of the last people, my generation of artists that, that sort of got to work with heavily um, in a dark room or coming out of that. Um, I did my undergraduate at the University of Newcastle. And so I understand and I love the kind of materiality, I guess, if you like, of film and of analog processes and paper. Um, but of course, my practice has changed. Um, you know, al alongside the changes in technology, and and I guess I certainly now embrace both mediums, and I use them um, uh, concurrently. You know, alongside each other, um, and that's actually kind of a nice thing because I get to move quite freely between uh, those you know analog and digital worlds, and in a sense they really complement each other. So, for example, I, I did a project um, at the Australian Centre of Photography in 2008. Um, where I was invited by the former curator um, Malcolm um, Smith to do a, a show in the, the, the sort of first gallery as you walk in, and that was a large scale, um, uh, I guess, a, a mural work. It was called Singularity, and the, the substrate that I use in a lot of that large work is, um, is is wallpaper. In a sense, that sort of traditional wallpaper that you might be familiar with that was used in, in houses in the 70s, for example, and now in groovy cafes in Surrey Hills, of course. But um, that particular um, substrate I, I use and, and um, in, in my work because it references, I'm a Polish migrant, and a lot of my, um, I guess, conceptual concerns are to do with that idea of displacement and traversing places and trying to perhaps find, um, you know, a place for oneself in a new homeland. So that idea of transporting materiality into a new place is, is quite important. Hence, um, using that, that medium um, specifically. And of course, to do that, I need to work with a large format camera, um, you know, 5.4, you know, uh, black rag over the head, uh, to get the sort of the clarity and the precision and the size of a file, if you like, uh, to then be able to output that to a massive scale which spans, you know, a three metre, four metre height by a 12 metre wall. Um, so I sort of marry those processes, I guess, quite importantly. Um, and so that, that idea of how a material is actually linked to the concept, I think, is, is the critical thing for me, that, that digital you know, technology will continue to change, but it, it comes down to the integrity of, I think, what is an artist, what, what you're doing and how you're communicating that through, um, through a particular platform. Um, you know, for example, I, um, 
I'm just about to start working with an honours student at UNSW Art and Design who's embarking on a very exciting project for his honours year. And he is, um, he's just returned from the UK with sort of the last couple of rolls of 16 and 8 millimetre um, film. Uh, when Kodak stopped producing it just a couple of years ago. And he, as an honours student, is about to just sort of grapple with that, um, that kind of conundrum of how to actually engage conceptually with what he's got in front of him, these reels of film to make, to make an artwork. So, which is, um, you know, it's quite an exciting project. Um, so, for me, it's about these constraints and the discipline of, of working with the medium and how that's sort of integral to shaping the final outcome. Um, you know, like in sculpture, I guess you might, you know, it's a big decision whether you use a nylon rope or a hemp rope, for example, to make, to make a sculpture because one or the other say a very different thing. Um, and film, of course, uh, you know, has distinct qualities, the way that it captures light, movement, colour, and of course that sort of, the temporality of film um, is quite different to digital. A and of course it being a very kind of mechanical process, um, you know, in the way that you produce work. There's also this lovely romantic notion of, you know, of, of photography inherently, you know, back to its sort of inception, um, of how an image is, you know, captured that light and the way that light is transferred onto the film, you know, contains somewhat, um, you know, the aura of its, um, of its sitter. So for me, that's, you know, quite poetic and I, and I love that sort of stuff. Um, but of course, that's not, you know, a pure reason to use that kind of medium. Um, so. You know, for me, there's, there's a number of artists that work um, sometimes quite nostalgically about, uh, you know, the demise of uh, analogue technology, like, you know, British artist Tacita Dean, for example, who had an amazing show that I got to see at the Tate um, Modern in 2011, which was called Film, and it was her um, you sort of using 16mm, uh, I think it was, um, to make this extraordinary installation, the Turbine Hall, if, you, if you're sort of interested in that kind of work, I'd, I'd look her up. Um, but I guess... You know, um, yeah, so I guess I think I've talked maybe enough. Do you think, Gary? Is that, does that give you a little bit <laughs> to sort of go start. on? Yeah, yeah, that's a good yeah. start. Um, you know, I guess I just sort of wonder how we're going to um, uh, kind of re... Uh, how we're going to keep and sort of revisit our, our archives and our kind of collections of what we have photographically over the next 20 years and how um, the changing in technology is going to sort of impact on that, how, how we sort of interpret our histories and how we preserve them and then how they are read because of course they'll be in a very different format. It won't be me any longer holding out my father's, you know, 35 millimetre slide that's gone completely pink of age from, you know, the 70s. I, you, know, you won't have that kind of thing to cherish, a, a sort of a physical thing. It will be very different. I think that's a kind of really important concern. But something quite exciting, you know, because artists, I think, you know, are constantly engaging and re you know, interrogating what is old and what is new. And I know, it, you know, UNSW Art and Design, we do that quite well. You know, we work from, you know, amazing kind of robotics labs to artists that, you know, interrogate, uh, you know, film and photographic processes and printmaking, etc. So that's kind of what we artists do. But yeah, it is a bit of a scary period. <laughs> mm. Thanks, Isabella. Michael. Oh, th thanks, Isabella. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was um, um, hoping to maybe come from a slightly different angle from, um, uh, from the world of publishing and to look at the idea of the digital and the analog in the context of, of um, art magazines and also the coverage of um, I guess photo media and digital art through uh, the magazines that I edit which are um, Art Monthly which has uh, um, uh, been going since 1987 and based in Canberra and of course um, my favourite magazine Photophile um, has been published here at the ACP since 1983, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess what really interests me in the subject today is, um, I guess we're talking about um, the play between the digital and the analogue. And in terms of a printed magazine, I guess in this environment there's very much the pressure now or the expectation that magazines are presented to you on a screen online digitally and I guess with these two magazines um, are resolutely um, printed um, which is um, a rarity in this day and age and um, uh, both accessible uh, digitally but they're primarily a print magazine and I guess that made me think about why that is the case and I, I, I do believe that there's still a real um, desire 
um, and I think it, it's uh, encapsulated or symptomatic maybe of visual artists themselves of, of a return to the, um, the handmade or the, the object mm -hmm. um, that people like um, something that's tactile, um, that's not, um, they love the screen, they love accessing material on screen and uh, viewing art on screen, but there's also the primacy of the printed object, um, which is also what a photograph is. So, um, so I guess that's, um, that's part, of, um, part of the question today is, um, I guess that, that's my day-to-day um, experience of, of the print and the digital and um, and both uh, Photophile is a, a, is more of a limited edition um, um, magazine almost like a printed photograph where there's only a, a certain thousand um, copies that are printed and then Art Monthly of course is a more um, mainstream magazine but again is still a, a very much a quality printed magazine um, and and I guess these days too there is that big um, Expectation, you know, that uh, magazines should be online or we should be blogging. But I, I do <coughs> have the faith, and um, our subscribers uh, um, reassure me that they do love something that they can hold and, and read and touch. Um, but in the course of editing both magazines, I've been here at the ACP um, um, since uh, the last few years since I, uh, since ACP relaunched Photophile, um, and. Um, and uh, during that time, um, the whole question of analog and digital has come up quite a lot in the gallery here. Um, and in fact, one of the first shows that was on here when I began editing Photophile was a wonderful project by Robert Basenko that lasted a whole year here in the gallery. Um, and each month, um, they would put um, the curators would put one um, vintage printed photograph on the wall and then they would print a digital enlargement next to it um, so you could see the interplay between the digital and the analogue mm -hmm. for you to actually work out which was which, um, what the different qualities were um, and then this played out over time, over 12 months, each month a different print was put up. So it was a very interesting process of where you could see the richness or the or the glossiness, or, or however you might see the difference between the two um, um, the two um, mediums, and then that in led uh, led um, I guess to some of the explorations of Photophile, um, and this is the latest issue um, which I'm shamelessly spruiking here. <laughs> um, and but I was just thinking in in this magazine, um, I was um, inspired partly by Art Monthly back in um, October it was. Um, we had an article by Mark Kimber, who heads the uh, photography department in Adelaide, and he put me in touch with um, a range of photographers in Adelaide who have, who I, I guess um, Isabella pointed out this nostalgia or return to um, old-fashioned techniques of photography that is um, very apparent at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so people like Mark Kimber. Um, people like James Tyler that are working with ambrotypes and daguerreotypes and tintypes and um, cyanotypes. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it um, and one of our photographers, uh, well, Will, um, is on the cover here. But that led me in turn to look at James Tyler and this issue of Photophile um, with these amazing um, ambrotypes that he's, um, uh, which are only probably about this this size that he mm. displays on shelves as sculptural objects. Um, mm. And so um, James, I know, is also going to feature in a, a show, I think, here at the ACP later on in the year, maybe. I'm not sure that's confirmed or not, but he could be. Um, I hope he will be. Um, and he, uh, looking at alchemy and uh, looking at the whole idea of the digital and the, um, and, uh, the um, analog. So, um, so I guess um, that's something that has really struck me looking at um, photo media um, at this current stage is that return to the handmade and the, the um, 19th century techniques. Um, and it's something interesting that we soon will be able to see in a, 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 a quite a major photography show about to open at the Art Gallery mm. of New South Wales um, called Australia, um, I think the photograph in Australia. Um, mm -hmm. which we have done a story on, which looks at the very early photographs in this country um, 
you know, by J.W. Lint and Charles Bayliss. Um, and then Judy Aneer, the curator, then brings us up to date with contemporary photographers who, it's almost coming full circle like Tracy Moffat again, this, this return to old fashioned techniques, people like, um, she also mentions people like Ben Couchy or Todd McMillan that are dealing with um, some of these old fashioned techniques. But also, um, I was wondering why that case may be, and I, I wonder in the world of, of digital possibilities um, where everything is so possible, whether artists are returning mm. to something that's perhaps more um, uh, more stripped back or more of a challenge, um, working with simplicity rather than with endless possibility. And I wonder if it's um, mm. perhaps that's where an artist can um, mm. talk about something mm. like this, but maybe mm. a return to basics in, in a way, and digital offers everything, but I guess mm. it's a work like Isabella's mm. marrying the two is mm. is the future, mm. yeah. Super, thanks mm. for We'll get back to that question. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk in a couple of sort of stretches. Uh, I'd like to start talking a little bit about Metro Screen, uh, and I'm the board member, as Gary mentioned. They're down the road in the um, Paddington Town Hall, just underneath the Chevelle Cinema, and have had a very interesting history. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things about digital technology that interest me and that I think are important um, to think about. So uh, firstly, we're very excited. We had a screening the other night, Thursday night, the slate screening of works that Metro's funded through its programs, Breaks and Raw Nerve. And Maureen Barron from Screen New South Wales announced that they'd be asking Metro Screen to manage the Emerging Filmmakers Fund, um, which coughs up, I think, three $30,000 grants a year, and um, as well as funding us to set up and manage a paid producer placement scheme. And she gave a terrific speech about the importance of supporting emerging industry players and their efforts, and the great work that Metro Screen does, which was all very exciting for us, and uh, we're feeling very warm at the moment about all of that. It was a very public vote of support, and uh, we have a long and sometimes complex relationship with state and federal funding bodies, so it was great to, um, to hear that. The place has had a very long history, which some of you are probably aware of, in this suburb, and, uh, and as always, especially now, reflected the changes in technology through its activities and interests. Community-led storytelling, a long commitment to community television, and now digital content, followed by online grassroots content. Crucially, as I'm sure all of you appreciate, Digital technology has opened up a completely new world of collaboration, production support and endless storytelling possibilities. Not to mention new business opportunities and the accompanying challenges, like how do we monetize all this new stuff. Mm. So part of Metro's role has been training the next generation of digital storytellers. And this has been going on now for quite a long time. We had a bold filmmaking on mobile phone sessions in the early 2000s and uh, more recently with our multi-platform transmedia and digital content producing diplomas. And the next one of these, by the way, starts in June uh, with applications open at the end of this month and you should subscribe to our e-news and you can go to metroscreen.org.au and, and enter your name in the appropriate box and you can keep up to date with everything the organisation is doing. This year we're working with the Walkleys to cover online storytelling with TV news journalism and the accompanying moral and ethical ideas raised around this, like that neo-noir crime thriller, Nightcrawler, about the criminal journalist, or crime journalist rather, which was released in the States last year. And uh, this will happen in late May as part of the Vivid Festival, their vid Vivid Festival of Ideas. Again, stick with the news. So on the digital technology front, it's been a wild and crazy time as the noughts and ones have wreaked havoc, revolutionised or simply struck terror into the hearts of industry after industry. Exciting for some of us at least is how it's opened up so many doors and of course closed others. Some thoughts about the new technologies, a few bullet points. Um, what interests me is they're used to manipulate, enhance and create images. The post-production industry most crucially has been affected by it, the role of digital effects 
Interestingly, Mike Bowdry, who's a Victorian, went to London in the 70s and he began probably the first um, company in the world to manipulate computer images digitally. That was the Computer Film Company, which was later bought by Frameworks. And uh, he's now back in Victoria growing grapes and making wine, which is a nice mm. <laughs> development from that. I mean, what the technology has done, very importantly, it's made some post work actually possible, which was impossible before. And not only that, and very importantly now, much faster than the olden days, much more affordable, and gratifyingly, for the creatives involved, much slicker. It's had a dramatic effect on distribution and exhibition, and that started in the late 90s, which has affected individuals. You know the musician from Melbourne, Gocha. I think this morning, uh, he's somebody I used to know, has been viewed on YouTube 610 million times. It's in the top 30 of most viewed videos on YouTube. And uh, organisations obviously have been affected, the BBC, News Corp and so on. And the film industry, of course, now, particularly in the US, distributes films instead of on prints by hard disk. And they've got a lock on them so that they're only valid for the period of exhibition. It's opened the doors to a much easier collaboration between creatives, producers, writers, designers, post-production. And uh, there's a New York writer that you may like to explore called Clay Shirky, who's written a book called Here Comes Everybody which is a very fascinating insight into that, the world of the, the internet and what that's caused. Profound effect on communication, content gathering, finding content, remote post-production provision, supervision, and someone was talking to me this morning about how the, the technician can be at home in bed probably and operate machines back at the shop when someone rings up from another company and saying this is not quite right, and they just say, oh yeah, and fix it in minutes or seconds or whatever. Accessibility of previously unavailable or hard to find material for both retrieval and supply. Triple J's Unearthed is an example of the ease of supply now of new musical content. It's not really my world, but it, it's had an astonishing effect on the creation, performance, recording and distribution of music, which the music industry sadly has largely not coped with very well. And much the same story applies to books. And for you and me, the consumers, much greater freedom and flexibility of consumption, catch-up television, for example, and places like Netflix who released the whole series of House of Cards in one afternoon, mm -hmm. um, which annoyed the, the broadcasters enormously, of course. And for the industries, both builders and users, the dramatic speed with which the technology is changing. That mobile phone that's in your pocket has got more computing power in it than Voyager 1. <laughs> Lots of issues, of course, copyright, censorship, bandwidth, the cost of um, technologically driven processes like scanning and digitization. And that's a big issue for another industry, for cultural institutions in particular, many of whom are wrestling with huge, unviewable collections. And they dream of making that available using scanning technology so that we can look at it online. And the other less pleasant thing is the ease now with which other cultures can intrude on ours. And so American culture you know, kind of floods this place and has for many years, but it's becoming easier and easier for them to influence as we look at all those outputs and don't worry about borders anymore. And powerful news organisations play a role in this, of course. Anyway, Gary, that's probably enough. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, <laughs> I think each of the speakers have opened up lots of different areas of questions for us to think about. I want to ask each of the speakers one question to follow up on in terms of what they have spoken about. Um, and I'll ask them in turn and feel free to, um, the speakers should feel free to interject as well. Uh, and then we'll open it up to the floor to give some opportunity for people to ask questions. Um, the first thing that occurs to me from what Isabella said, which is very interesting, I think, in terms of this shift between traditional media, analog photography, and digital media, analog photography. The question I have is, what kind of impact does that have on the conceptualization of content within your work? If you're thinking about how photon impacts chemically, versus the idea of translating certain light messages into 
binary digits, mm, ones yeah. and zeros. Mm. What impact does that have on the way you deal with content? Mm. Mm. Um, I think that's a really yeah, great question. But great question, Gary, but also a great point, because I mean, for me, those two um, ends of the scale, um, I guess when I talk about integrity, for me, where amazing art comes from, not maybe that I particularly make that kind of art, but um, you know, it comes from those yeah, two areas. <laughs> I hope so. Um, you know that there's a sort of um, that substance somewhere of, of the lineage of the work or where where it's come from materially is important. Um, I guess one of those examples is that you know a lot of um, the content of my work or subject, if you like, is you know inherently landscape. Um, it's not really landscape photography in, in a traditional sense, but it does. Um, depict the landscape in a more perhaps uncanny way. So, you know, I'm very much um, true in a particularly perhaps conservative way of, of working with large format photography because, you know, inherently that's, that's sort of the history of that, um, of that landscape tradition. So, um, is that sort of what you mean? Yeah. yeah. But also when I was talking about the wallpaper as it, you know, being a digital material, um, uh, you know, originally, it was offset printed. Uh, you know, in the 70s. Um, now it's a digitally printed. But that that being able to provide a sort of escapist fantasy for the armchair traveller. You know, not to have to leave their apartment, but just escape through whatever is on the wall. You know, so that materiality is as, as a sort of form um, on the wall. So, I guess there. I mean, I will also work with with sort of found. Um, maybe I, yeah. I don't know if I'll go into much more. Maybe we can continue that. But um, okay. yeah. All right, that but I think um, that return, maybe yeah. if I can just touch on that, what Michael sort of mentioned of a lot of artists returning to um, early processes, you know, has, has occurred, you know, I think since, you know, for, for, for a while, but particularly now. Um, and I think that there is a sort of um, uh, a desire to, to, to perhaps reduce or kind of create boundaries to kind of, I mean, the more parameters that you create within your, your work or the concept, the more clarity perhaps you will. Um, uh, you know, evoke, or, you know, through it. So I think mm. perhaps less is, you know, more. But, but then, you know, in saying that, if you work uh, digitally, I mean, yeah, I'm, maybe I'll just leave that. Can I add something? Um, without getting myself in a hole there, yeah. And Chris? Mm. Oh, look, I was just reminded when you spoke earlier of um, the relationship, obviously, between the technology we're talking about and images. Mm. And uh, I've become very interested in the museum world. Mm. And one of the things that happens to people who work in that world is they get given stuff, mm. huge amounts of stuff, mm. and very often it's unidentified. Mm. And uh, I think there's a really nice story about, was it the Smithsonian, who had a huge collection of images, very old images, probably from the early part of last mm -hmm. century, and none of them were identified. Wow. And they stuck them all on Flickr Commons, or thousands at a time, mm. and of course, people go into Flickr Commons and they look at the photo and say, oh, mm. my grandfather used to mm. blah, blah, blah. Mm. And these long stories then yep. developed under single images and the museum learnt stuff about images they had no idea about. It was just yeah. a really nice example of how mm. the internet and digital technology yeah. has made some mm. whole new process possible. Yeah, mm. I agree, yeah. Mm. yeah. Maybe we could yeah. um, ask Michael to discuss a, a little bit further um, why he thinks there's, there's been been this return to traditional media mm -hmm. in photography? Yeah. Well, I was thinking. Um, I, I was thinking what Isabella said about setting uh, boundaries and mm -hmm. defining. I, I think that's that 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 is perhaps the answer in, in one respect. In a, um, as a, a sense of limitation and containment, where where everything becomes so boundless and and possible, um, it's. Um, and you know, and it made me think of someone like Simran Gill too, mm. with the uh, disused um, or um, superseded technologies, with you know her rolls of film that mm. were about to expire. Mm. That then she used those up in series around Marrickville. Mm. Um, I guess it's, and and I know when I asked her about that series and said, is it a sense of nostalgia? And she said, oh, I hate that word. Um, but it was. There is something. I guess it's it, it's about the marking of time too, and and that's where photography is so potent. And I guess going back to these old technologies is in, in, in a sense is acknowledging its its um, history and its roots and where we came from. But with someone like James Tyler, he is um, drawn to the ambrotype because he is of Maori and mixed Indigenous and mixed Irish background. But he 
uh, feels strongly drawn back to that time because that was the time when his Maori ancestry was first negotiating colonialism and so the camera was one of the first interfaces um, I guess yeah. for his history, his um, mm. heritage so he's drawn so back that, to it in that, that respect. That important mm. impact on the nature mm. of content in mm. his work mm. and that's what drives it there. Mm. I wanted to ask a second question about the nostalgia that um, your two publications have for the printed word. Mm. What do you think the real lifespan of that's going to be? Well, um, as long as we've got libraries um, and... How long will that be? Oh gosh, yes. Well, we're just in the process um, <laughs> with the ANU of getting um, hopefully this digitised, um, all our archives. Um, so at least we know they'll be <coughs> digitally archived. But um, I've got faith in the, the uh, printed the, the printed form, um, from at least for my lifetime and my maybe my children, grandchildren's time. Um, but who knows? It's just something I feel drawn to aesthetically, um, and um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I guess mm. I have hope. Can I? I have hope too. <laughs> um, just going back Chris. to the, the nostalgia, I'm just amused in, you know, from the world that I used to be in, is how vinyls re-emerged. Mm. Mm. And people are repressing vinyl, they're not just finding old versions of it. And there are shops in particularly the big cities in the US which have got wall-to-wall -wall vinyl. Mm. And just like High Fidelity, the film is full of serving nerds who will engage you in conversation the whole day if you've got mm. the time. Mm. And, um, and that started a long time ago with musicians, in fact, who chose to uh, buy old valve-driven amplifiers because they reckon they sounded better than the new solid-state digital ones that other guitarists played with. Rory Gallagher, I think, was an example of that, and he had some funny old thing with glowing tubes in it. And um, I don't know what that means, really. It doesn't really appeal to me, but... Um, well, I think it means a lot. I mean, mm. a company like Lynn Sondack never went out of business and never stopped yeah. making turntables. Yeah, so. you're right. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, Kodak have stopped mm. making film, as far That's, as I understand, yeah. which well, is... Well, they've celluloid film for... But, um, mm. They are, yeah, they're no longer... They're not no, making it, no. yeah. So it's now really, I think, about, um, you know, I think those older processes that you can, um, you know, with a chemistry and a scientific laboratory kind of create yourself, like ambrotypes. It's, and it's a boutique and activity. It's, a, it's going to be kind of boutique industry, I, I, I guess, where you can, you know, make your own chemistry because you can use, you know, yeah. um, uh, which, you know, which source chemicals. But it, yeah, it does, it yeah. does. But I guess it's going to be interesting in terms of the lifespan of bigger companies that you know, still are producing a uh, film for the mass market. Um, mm. How long that can be sustained in terms of market demand. But you know, if there's vinyl, if there's still life in vinyl, if one, one company stayed mm. afloat, then hey, maybe yeah. someone will hopefully, because it would be, it would be a real shame, I think, mm. if in, you know, if in, you know, 20 years time, we didn't really, you know, our eye couldn't, um, you know, had never seen film and couldn't actually sort of distinguish film from analog. You know, imagine if you couldn't distinguish maybe, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean something like 2001, uh, you know, Space Odyssey to, you know, some re, yeah, anyway. You just but can't dance when vinyl's playing, that's the right. problem. You know, <laughs> 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 but I guess there, oh, something I hadn't added before too, I guess, to looking at um, the magazine format is also the, the, the photo book, which we've got evidence out here today too, is the, um, I, I, I would say there is a there's also yes, a certain definitely. return to the mm. photo book too, and in the same way there's a return to materiality mm. and photography. There's I would say that that has come in 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 the wake of mm. digital. I mean it is this clinging on to something that people fear will vanish forever. So mm. that that gives this sense of urgency and connection to to these mediums. Mm. I don't know. Mm. In a slightly mm. different direction. I just want to raise a couple of questions um, from. Chris's discussion, of which he raised many, I think, but there, there are three things that really struck me, Chris. Uh, one was your discussion about collaboration. The idea of collaboration, of course, multiplies the author. And in the fine arts business, we've been focused for many centuries on the sole voice. So the idea of collaboration is obviously very fashionable. Um, but it also has deep and serious um, artistic implications. The second thing is how do we take all these um, whiz-bang technologies and monetize them? I'm very interested in how um, all of these industries take shape. It's all very well for our, our funders to 
support emerging people, but what happens when they emerge? How big is the industry and what kind of monetization does it have supporting it? And the other thing is the underlying potential of um, narrativity, of storytelling that you raise. This idea that all of these tools that we all have access to now and are very accessible even on our phone creates the possibility for that archive of, of life story, of life experience in a very different way from our photo albums. We're actually telling an entire narrative, not just capturing an identity. So those three things, collaboration, storytelling, and monetization. <laughs> I, I just want to make a remark about collaboration, which I'm sure you know about, but I remember a film that made a huge impression on me was Camille Claudel. And um, if you don't know the film, I recommend it's about a young woman who's turned into Rodin's mistress and she turns out to be a very fine sculptor herself. And what I learned watching that film was that a lot of those great artists, in fact, had teams of young people who sometimes were students, and a lot of them actually executed the work under the direction. So some of the sculptures that are attributed to Rodin may well have come from people working in his workshop. And her stuff, by the way, uh, you can see some of that in uh, the Rodin Museum in Paris. And, and I think there probably was a an element of collaboration there, but every time, just to bring it into the present, every time um, people talk about innovation and um, people having, you know, amazing eureka moments, uh, the truth as it turns out, or most of the truth as it turns out, is that fantastic ideas like that come about, A, through an enormous amount of hard work, and, uh, and very often because of the um, combination of people together. There was a great research done recently um, on research, scientific research laboratories around the world who were all doing great stuff, of course. And it turns out that a lot of the fantastic ideas, rather than coming from a single person bent over a microscope, happened at coffee in the morning when they were sitting around discussing the work they were doing and someone would say something which would light something in the the hearer's mind and, and all of that has quite a, a work on it but every time people talk about innovation I hear the word collaboration being used in conjunction with it mm -hmm. which is I think it's a really important thing I mean there, I know there's some very clever people who work on their own but um, really fantastic work can come out of people working together and the great thing about where we are now that person that you're working with or discover who shares your interest and skills or ambitions could be on the other side of the planet doesn't actually matter where they are and you might not even see them physically and so there's lots of Skype and other ways you can look at them or just talk to them. So what was the second one? Uh, storytelling and monetization. Uh, monetization, I was chatting to a guy the other day and we were talking actually about Goetz's example and apart from um, doing astonishing things for his brand, um, he's making a lot of money out of the advertising that sits alongside the YouTube clip. And if you've got 610 million people looking at your YouTube clip, that's a very large audience, and there's a little bit of money with each one of those views, which I think you do deals with Google and you share that, that money. So I don't think he's remotely worried about people downloading his clips for nothing. Mm. That doesn't apply to everyone, of course. And storytelling? The other thing about monetization, very quickly, <laughs> was um, I was talking to an author last year a Sydney author, and uh, I was kind of, you know, being silly and trying to tease her about e-books, and because uh, I thought that might annoy her and we might have a robust discussion. And she said, look, Chris, <laughs> I love the trade paperback. Hardbacks aren't published here anymore. So the trade paperback is the big event in an author's life. She says she loves it. It's like the red carpet of the publishing industry. But she said, Chris, I make more money out of Kindle. <laughs> and the thing behind that is, and this is what Amazon have realised and Apple have realised, mm. that if you make stuff easy to buy, people will buy it in much greater numbers. I mean, I fell in love, slightly ashamed, of, with um, Lee Child, the, um, the Jack Reacher books. And uh, he's written 17, all of which I have. And invariably at 11.30 at night, I'd finish a book and think, damn, and in 30 seconds, I had the next one. It was very satisfying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically. I, the storytelling one, storytelling is not really my, my forte, but I see it all around me in the work, for example, that happens down at Metro. 
and uh, and can be I guess be contributed to by the much easier access to source material that drives some some storytelling, or you might it might give you access to original content. It's not quite the same thing, but the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam have digitised. 140,000 or something, but an enormous number of their old works. They're available online in very high resolution and everyone is welcome to download them and do whatever they like with them. And there's a part of their website called The Right Studio and it teaches you about the kinds of things you can do and what some people are doing is taking bits of old masters and mixing them with bits of other old masters and creating completely new works. Yeah. And the museum encourages it. As far as they're concerned, I mean, they're all old masters, so the copyright's gone, but as far as they're concerned, it's owned by everyone. And there's even some loony in Amsterdam who's put images of old masters on his bicycle tyres and he said it rains a bit in Amsterdam so when the streets are wet it leaves an impression of the old masters <gasps> on the street as some of the that he rides down. So people are doing all sorts of crazy things and the museum loves it. They're, I mean they're an unusual example I guess because a lot of museums are a bit nervous about this stuff being used in untoward ways. Thanks Chris. We might open it up to the floor. Do people have questions or comments? For the panel? Yes? Well, probably answer from the Cultural Conversations project. I'm interested because a couple of years in your talks that already mentioned the uh, kind of long detail and long term accessibility. And it seems to me. Long, long term accessibility. accessibility. Yes. If it's a digital market, you are going to sell a digital market. Maybe you've got consumer rights legislation, which means I, as a purchaser, have an expectation that your artwork will continue for an agreed period of time. And as an artwork, that may be 100 years. Can you imagine trying to access your Microsoft Word file in the first time? Mm. How are you going to manage that with multiple time-based media? Mm. I mean, in, in Korea, for example, I've just come back from Korea, and there's some amazing work happening over there where people are beginning to integrate digital, physical information <coughs> into mm. an artwork. Now, A, who's going to buy that? That's, that's the monetization issue. Mm. But the second issue is how can you get, as an artist, guarantee that that work is going to be accessible mm. and usable in the year of time? Mm. And, and there are Nanjing paper works now that are beginning to be inaccessible mm. because the televisions are broken. Mm. You can't buy an old browse television. Mm. Right. Yes, please, Rafi. Mm. manages to, to look after Nanjing paper works. Mm. So you can't replace a television by a flat screen TV. It just doesn't look right. You know? So mm. you have all those issues mm. as an artist that you need to somehow mm. I, I think that's a, you can talk about. That's a great question. Would the panel like to address it? Can I just, maybe just one little comment before you continue, because you've probably got a lot to say about that. But um, I, uh, I sold a video work uh, last year, and um, part of the process of selling that was you know, in, uh, putting it into a, one of those special hard cases and putting it on a, on a USB drive that was sort of safe to be thrown out into the universe, basically, um, into a number of different versions of that video file. So um, that was quite overwhelming, I agree with you, in terms of, you know, uh, an artwork that was going out to, into the world um, because it was purchased and then the longevity of that and the longevity of those particular files. So um, I guess luckily my work there isn't the inherent medium in which it's viewed on that's integral to that video piece but I think it's definitely an issue and I don't work a lot with video so it's not my thankfully um, problem. <laughs> but um, mm, maybe Gary you've got more to add. Exactly, exactly of course yeah. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Um, maybe we, I mean, I think it's such a fascinating question. If I can jump in, maybe we're approaching it from the wrong angle, which is to assume that, of course, um, artworks are forever. 
maybe they're not forever. Maybe mm. most artwork that's made ends up in the trash anyway. And that the archive that we have created is tremendously special and we should try and preserve that. So what happens for the digital artist when the technologies change? Maybe they have to understand that getting into the business, it's a temporal business mm. from the outset and that those things are not going to last I saw on the news this morning that there was incredible outrage that um, ISIS had um, destroyed a particular um, archaeological site in um, Syria um, in, in the last 24 hours, I think, last 48 hours. Um, there was more outrage about that than about all the deaths that have taken place in Syria, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting comment on our perception of what constitutes our archive and our attitude towards civilization. So the issue that we want to think about is where does the digital archive, um, what's its temporal expectation? Is it 100 years? Is it less? Um, is it transformable into a new kind of archive along the way? I think all of those questions are in a state of flux and evolution. I don't think it's a fixed business and museums are, are very um, concerned about their um, their, the issues of storage around significant uh, cultural information. But if, but if you're going to change the nature of an art, the digital art and say it only has a limited lifespan, there are still legal issues that need to be resolved. I mean, under, under consumer affairs legislation, if I buy one of your works, there is an expectation that it will work in my house for a period of time. Now, you can say 10 years, but the law will say something completely different. And suddenly you as an artist have a liability to come to my place and fix it. <laughs> so it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with that now? I'll make a new one. <laughs> I, I, think the na I think you're absolutely well, right. I think the that. nature of the legal contract will change. <laughs> and that um, people won't be thinking about permanence in the same way they thought about permanence mm. of marble mm. or bronze or oil paint. They'll be thinking about a different kind of archival contract. And that has yet to be resolved. If you buy digital artwork at the moment and expect it to last a thousand years, you're probably a bit optimistic. Mm. There was a wonderful example actually in, in um, Alan Davies who was head of the State Library um, photography collection. He, uh, before he left um, as the curator there, he, um, in their collection they had the wet plate collodion work from mm -hmm. the 19th century which um, I don't think they had um, any prints of but then in his, um, it was um, I think a couple of years ago they digitally um, printed them and workshop them and created these amazing enlargements but basically they so there's I think also the possibility of um, technology uh, being used to the benefit of, of reinventing and re resurrecting work um, in ways that we won't we can't imagine in the future um, with superseded artworks where mm. technologies will come in and um, hopefully the, the powerhouse were mm. were given a wonderful collection of glass plates once they were very big, and the first thing they did with them, which I guess is what you do when you give them glass plates like that, is to do a contact print, which is not terribly satisfying, but it's a way of looking at it. And then someone much, much more recently, and this stuff dates from early last century, mm. or even earlier, someone very recently decided uh, they discovered that when they scanned it digitally, the resolution, in fact, of the original was much higher than they expected. And so he cleverly created a sequence of photographs of pictures and had some music playing. And it was only when you got to the end of them did you realise that every image you've been looking at, and there were about 20 of them, had all been parts of the one photograph. It was a photo taken in Hyde Park and there were people all over the place. Mm -hmm. And he just came in and the resolution was so good mm -hmm. that it would tolerate that kind of expansion. It was, very, it was a clever thing to do. It was just a, mm -hmm. yet another piece of work coming from something old. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? I'd just like to make one comment about um, uh, this preservation. And that is that there is a company in Italy who is now refilming uh, digital works that we've been back on to film yet. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. <laughs> in reverse. <laughs> That's great. Mm. It, that's monetizing, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yes. 
and that of collaboration about ownership and how we could begin to adapt to that the idea of uh, creative commons and those new definitions of copyright and ownership. We, um, there's an organisation, if you're interested in that world, called the Australian Digital Alliance and um, they concern themselves with copyright reform. You may know that the Australian Law Reform Commission spent a long time looking at the law, which is in a complete mess in this country, as far as I can make out, and what they were arguing for was a fair dealing regime much more like the United States, where it's much better. And so you can have fair dealing for educational purposes and, and so on. And this country is just a real mess from that point of view. And the copyright is really controlled by very wealthy content owners rather than the government who really should say there are some areas which should be left out. Blind people, for example. There was a conference recently in Canberra by this organisation and it was opened by someone who works for Vision Australia and is in a number of international organisations concerned with accessibility for people who are vision impaired. And that was such an upsetting story about what's going on in the copyright world here, which is, ends up preventing blind people from having access to books that have got their full table of contents, their index and all that stuff that you and I take for granted. Mm. ADA. Interesting crowd. Mm. Um, I think we're out of time. So I'd like to thank the audience um, for attending and uh, staying focused. And I'd particularly like to thank Isabella, Michael and Chris uh, for their very insightful um, comments uh, and commentary on the whole world of art and digital world. So thank you. Thank you.